So my name is Stefan Heinozzi. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, applying polling techniques to the Verdeo block emulation inside QEMU. So basically, what, what the problem is is that high IOPS devices, they're very fast. They have very low latency to complete an I.O. request. And so any virtualization, any software overhead that we impose per IOP um, is just going to become a really big problem. It used to not be such a big problem because disks were slower. Now they're very fast. And um, so we need to optimize this. So that's what this talk is about. Um, uh, just a little bit about me. I work in Red Hat's virtualization team. Um, I focus mainly on storage, uh, tracing, and performance. OK, so this trend that I just mentioned. Um, on this graph, you can see uh, a spinning disk, a serial ATA disk. Um, you can see still a spinning disk, a, a serial attached SCSI disk. Uh, and then we start to get into the solid state storage devices. And you can see from the graph that immediately the IOPS jumps up. These devices are capable of doing a, a lot more I.O. requests per second. Um, and if, if you look at both extremes of the graphs, with a spinning disk, you might have a seek time of around a millisecond. Uh, with, a, with some of the latest Intel NVMe drives, the spec says, the device spec says that it, it might take 10 microseconds for reads and writes. So there's a huge, huge orders of magnitude difference between these two. So obviously, the software stacks that we have, they might be fine for spinning disks, but we're going to notice the problems in the overhead with um, high IOPS devices. Um, and I'm just really making this point here. When I started working on QMe in 2010, one of the first things I did was a Vertio block um, performance uh, tracing, latency tracing work. Uh, and I published that back then, and so I went back to it now and I looked at it. And if we have that same software overhead, and the truth is we do, we, we haven't massively changed that, it was fine back then. But now it's really painful because since the overall time to complete requests on an, on an NVMe drive is so low, um, it's just a much bigger fraction of the total request latency. And so this talk is basically all about latency. It's all about uh, benchmarks with Q-depth 1. It's not about trying to do lots of parallel I.O., getting the most throughput and the most IOPS. It's not about scaling it. It's just about latency-sensitive workloads. They might send out one request, and they need to wait for completion before they can do the next thing. So how can we make the time for a single request as small as possible? Feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have any questions. Um, the end game of all this is obviously that you can do uh, PCI pass-through, and then you can get rid of the software layer. Um, the problem is that the software layer does offer uh, a lot of features. It offers uh, things like the ability to take a device uh, and split it up and share it between multiple VMs, and they each have their slice. Uh, it also offers things like snapshots or encryption or I.O. throttling, backup, storage migration. There's a bunch of features that it supports. So for general purpose virtualization, you probably still want those features. If you have the, the money, if you're willing to spend the money on the hardware, uh, or if, well, and if performance is your number one priority, you might decide to do pass-through. But I think for the general purpose case, we still need to be able to um, use high IOPS devices uh, in a general purpose setting, we're, we're not going to be able to dedicate and throw so much hardware at the problem. So this is what this is about. And originally in the Red Hat performance team, Carl Rister, um, about a year ago, he, he was looking into this because he found that he was running storage benchmarks on the Intel NVMe drives. And he saw that the, the overhead was very high. And so he was trying to get to the bottom of this. And one of the things he did in order to find the overhead is he used tracing. And he traced events that happen throughout the life cycle of an I.O. request. So from when the I.O. request starts and when the, the guest submits the I.O. request. And he was looking at um, the, the, the time it takes, because each of these trace events has a timestamp. And so you can figure out, OK, it took this long to get from point A to get to point B. Um, I'm not going to present a lot of tracing data. Instead, let's just look at the high-level flow of uh, an I.O. request. Let's look at the life cycle. 
So this is the submission path. This is when the guest submits an I.O. request, a read or a write to the storage device. And this is somewhat simplified, but the, the main parts are there, especially the main parts that we're going to optimize in this discussion. Um, OK, so the first thing is that when an I.O. request is ready to be sent to the disk, um, the guest will kick the vert queue. The request has been put in the vert queue. And this kick is actually a hardware register, right? And it traps out into the KVM kernel module. Um, so control switches over to the host from the vCPU to the host. And the KVM kernel code, um, it recognizes that address. It knows that there is a vertio a block device, or it knows that this is a special address. Um, and there is an IO event FD a file descriptor associated with that address. And that file descriptor um, gets signaled. So it's, it's written to, it's made active. QEMU um, has event loop threads. So QEMU is an event-driven architecture. And so QEMU on a separate CPU um, can have a thread that is waiting for this event FD. And as soon as it sees that that event FD is ready and is active, it can go and look into the vert queue because QEMU has access to the guest memory. So it can go into that descriptor ring, it can pull out the request, and it can begin processing it. Um, so this doesn't happen synchronously. Instead, what happens is that the KVM kernel module marks that event FD as ready, and then it returns straight back to the vCPU so that the guest can continue executing, because you don't want the guest CPU to be paused while I.O. emulation is taking place. Um, the problem with doing that, of course, is that you can see I, I've drawn a dotted line on the sequence diagram, is that there's this dependency. QEMU is going to get woken up sometime after the event FD was signaled. But that's really up to the scheduler. It's really up to the host kernel scheduler to decide when can this QEMU event loop wake up. There might be other things running on all the CPUs on the host. So maybe QEMU can't even react right away. Even the guest has already kicked us, and we know there's going to be work coming. QEMU isn't able to run yet. So that's one possible source of latency. Uh, once QEMU actually runs and it grabs the request. It, um, so for this discussion, I'm just going to talk about the Linux AIO, um, also known as the AIO equals native option, because that's usually the, the most high performance option for local disks. Uh, so that's often deployed. And so basically, QEMU will call the Linux AIO IO submit system call in order to submit that IO request on behalf of the guest. And now we've submitted it. And eventually, the disk will see the request once the Linux kernel block layer um, has given it to the driver and the driver has given it to the device. OK, so we, we've talked about the submission. We've talked about how requests are given to the disk. Um, the reverse is the completion path. So that's when uh, the disk completes a request. Uh, it will raise an interrupt, um, and the host kernel will see that a request is complete. And then the Linux AIO code inside the host kernel will match up that request with the Linux AIO request. And it will signal an event FD. So again, we have an event FD file descriptor here that's used to signal. And again, we have the QEMU event loop, which wants to respond to that. And it's going to get scheduled by the host kernel scheduler at some point in time, hopefully soon. Um, so that's the completion path. And the issue that I've highlighted as I've explained it is that we have these asynchronous points where um, the QEMU event loop, that thread may not be scheduled. And it will take some time for it to wake up. So we have a notification latency that we're adding. This is something that's purely a QEMU architecture thing. It's something that is really not there if you uh, run on the host, right? If you run on the host, you don't have this QEMU layer. You don't have these event FDs. You're not jumping back and forth. So what's one way to tackle that? Uh, so when we saw that the uh, latency that was being introduced um, was, was due to notifications, one approach to tackling notifications is polling. And I think a lot of other presentations and talks uh, at KVM Forum this year has, have also applied polling in different places. Um, and that's because it's a technique you can use to reduce latency. When notifications are slow, because the wake up operation just takes a long time, um, you can use polling instead. And what polling does is you continuously monitor the object you're interested in, and when it changes, you can react immediately. The reason why you react immediately is because you don't have to wake up. You're already running. So you can, you can see polling on the left side there, or on the right side for you. Um, 
So it has some obvious drawbacks. So first of all, if we're doing polling, if we're sitting in a loop watching this register change or whatever we're doing, that CPU on the host is tied up and it's dedicated to that task. Nothing else can run on it. Also, if, if you go back to what I said in the beginning, a spinning disk might have a seek time of one millisecond. Imagine your IO requests take one millisecond. We really don't want to pull the CPU for one whole millisecond just to have a fast wake up time right at the end there because it's very inefficient. We're hogging the CPU all the time, but there's very little work to do, very few events that are happening. So these are some of the drawbacks of polling, and especially if you deploy it in a uh, kind of general purpose virtualization um, uh, solution, um, you might not want to have outright polling threads that are dedicated and that are using up an entire CPU all the time and running flat out. So luckily, there are some things we can take advantage of that, uh, take advantage of in order to make this more efficient and not to suffer these drawbacks. Um, so this graph shows you um, the I.O. latency uh, on the host running uh, an I.O. benchmark. And what's interesting is you can see the percentiles. On this graph, you can see that this particular NVMe drive that I ran, 90% of all requests that we did, they all completed within about 10 microseconds. And what's interesting is that in order to get to 95, in order to go from 90% to 95%, there's a huge jump. Things got a lot slower there. So you would have to, if you were polling, you could poll for just 10 microseconds and you'd be able to see the completions of 90% of all your IO requests. And then you've got 10% left that are gonna take longer. That's, that's that tail end over there where it starts to take a really long time. So we were talking about polling efficiency. It's obviously worth polling for just 10 microseconds. And then you kind of have to decide at what point is it, is it just too expensive to continue polling waiting for those last few stragglers. And so this is what adaptive polling algorithms are about. So adaptive polling algorithms, instead of just flat out polling all the time, they, they will only poll for a certain amount of time when it seems like it's efficient to poll and we're actually going to do useful work. And at some point, they'll let go of the CPU and say, polling is probably no longer effective. This is taking a long time. If the request is taking such a long time, why not just use the notification mechanism? That way I can let go of the CPU, other tasks can run, and I'm not hogging the entire system. Okay, so those are, those, are, those are two basic principles, but that's not really enough to do adaptive polling. So the problem is when you, when you have a graph like this, um, IO latency isn't deterministic. It's not the case that no matter what IO throw, I throw at the disk, it's always gonna be that 90% finishes within 10 microseconds. There are a lot of factors that can influence the performance. So if you can think about things like how many reads versus how many writes, or am I doing parallel IO requests, or am I only just doing one at a time? What about the block size? Or what about the internal state of the device, the caches on the device, or what the firmware is doing, right? So it means the device is gonna respond differently, and this graph is not really static. As your workload runs, and as it does different things, it's actually gonna shift around and move. So if we thought we had the perfect algorithm and we tuned and we set in one value, it would probably be terrible on some machines. So an adaptive polling algorithm needs to be able to self-tune itself. It needs to be able to adjust so that it will be efficient and it will also recognize workloads where polling is useless. Say you're on a spinning disk and you're doing lots of seeks, let's not poll. Let's just do use notifications because they're gonna take a long time anyway and we don't wanna tie up the CPU. So that's what this is all about. And in QEMU, we've implemented a polling algorithm in the event loop. Um, it's based on, so the algorithm is kind of the same, uh, same approach as the KVM kernel modules, halt, poll, and S uh, algorithm. And the idea is basically it tries to find a sweet spot and it stays there, but if the graph shifts, if, if behavior changes, then it will scale back the polling if polling's not effective or if, or if it can find a sweet spot somewhere else, it will try to find it. I'm not going to go into great detail about that. We don't have time for that. Um, but I do want to talk a little bit about the implementation. Because for those of you who, who are familiar with polling, you might be like, yeah, this is how we can reduce latency. This, this all makes sense. But if you know QEMU, QEMU is an event-driven program, and it uses an event loop. And all it ever does in the event loop is wait for file descriptors. 
So you might be thinking, how do we pull file descriptors? There's no good API, there's no low latency efficient API to pull file descriptors because the way to interact with file descriptors is to use system calls. And we don't want to use a, a bunch of system calls. Um, it, will be, it will be hard to do this stuff efficiently because we have sockets, we have other types of file descriptors in the event loop. Um, what we need for efficient polling is we need a memory location, something where we can literally just load, fetch that memory location, check its value. Uh, we don't want to do something really heavyweight because that in itself has its own latency. So it might seem like it's going to be impossible to integrate polling with the QEMU main loop, and what we're going to have to do is just have a separate thread that's dedicated to it. But luckily, it turns out we don't have to do that, at least not for Vertio Block and Vertio SCSI. Uh, so that's what I'm going to explain now, the, the implementation. So we've seen this graph before. This is the um, Vertio Block submission um, sequence diagram. It's um, it's, it's how we submit requests. And we said that the, the, the steps that um, can incur extra latency are steps one and two when we're signaling the event FD and where we need to get scheduled. So the trick is we don't need to really wait for the event FD. QMU has access to guest memory. It has access to this descriptor ring. So what it can do is it can just peek inside the descriptor ring and see as soon as the guest driver has already put a request in there. It doesn't need to wait for the kick at all, actually. Um, and so that's what we can do. And that's how we pull the descriptor ring. We still keep the vertq kick, though, because remember, the adaptive algorithm, after a while, is going to give up and say, let's go back to notifications. So it will use the event FD if it has to, in the case of slow requests. Um, OK, that's good. But what about Linux AIO? So once we've passed the request to the kernel, you know, we have a file descriptor. We've passed the request to the kernel. How do we pull that? Can we do it? Turns out we got lucky. The API, the, the user space kernel ABI, actually has a thing that will allow us to pull. The reason for that is because Linux AIO has a piece of memory, a ring, that's shared by the kernel and user space. And whenever Linux AIO in the kernel completes a request, it actually marks it in the user space, and then it expects you to use some system calls to find out the state and, and, and complete the request. But you don't have to do that. Turns out, you can actually just pull that ring directly. So we got lucky. That wasn't really something, you know, it's not going to work for every type of file descriptor. You can't pull everything. But for Vertio Block and Vertio SCSI, these two mechanisms mean we can really just do polling. Um, and it's integrated into the QEMU event loop. OK, so uh, what does performance look like? Um, this is on an Intel NVMe drive. It's not the very latest generation, but it's still very fast. <laughs> um, so. These are the 4K random reads. Um, and basically what, what, what you can see here is that without polling, with polling, polling increased the IOPS by 37%. So that, that, that's, a, that's a very nice increase that we get from polling. And that shows you that by eliminating this overhead, we've really cut out um, a significant chunk of the IO latency. This is with QDepth1. Again, just a reminder, this is all just about latency. I'm not trying to put a lot of I.O. through, but just latency sensitive. Now, on this graph, the, the host performed extremely well. It did 48K uh, IOPS. And actually, I've just learned here at KVM Forum what my mistake was, because I was seeing inconsistent results. But what I forgot to do when I ran this benchmark is I didn't initialize the NVMe drive properly so that um, it was fully populated. And so since it has the flash translation layer, it's possible that um, there was some regions of this device were still zeroed. So when you do an IO to it, it completes very, very, very quickly. Um, so I'm not sure if I can trust the host part of this benchmark. Depending on how much you've written to the device, it will perform differently. But what I do remember is that when I ran these benchmarks, both the no polling and polling were run side by side, and there were no writes in between. So the device stayed in the same state. So that's comparable. The host thing, I'll need to revisit. But if any of you do NVMe benchmark, <laughs> um, you need to do this. <laughs> OK, so um, another thing that might be interesting is for those of you who have been following kernel development, you might know that the kernel itself does some polling too. So if we're doing polling inside QEMU and the kernel is also doing polling, will they interfere? Or what's the relationship? What's going on? So the kernel block layer in Linux has two types of polling. One is called IRQ poll, and that is basically an interrupt mitigation mechanism 
it's not really a, a request polling thing comparable to, to what we do in QEMU. What it means is that if an interrupt comes in, instead of handling that interrupt and then re-enabling the interrupt and, and waiting for the next one, what the kernel does is it just leaves it disabled. And instead it has a soft IRQ that will pull the completion ring. So some drivers use this. And it means that they can avoid having lots and lots of interrupts coming in and interrupting the CPU um, during periods of high uh, completion. Um, but it doesn't really interfere with QEMU, so that's not a bad thing, that, that's fine. The other one is the new mechanism um, called block MQ poll. So the multi queue block layer has added this driver interface and it makes it possible for the kernel and, and also obviously for, for user space to say, please poll on this IO request and let me know as soon as it completes. However, it's only really useful for synchronous IO. And since the configuration we're talking about here is Linux AIO, um, that block MQ poll doesn't kick in at all. It's not, it's not used in this case. So if, you have, if you're using AIO in user space, you can still do your own polling because the kernel's not gonna do it for you. It won't help you there. So I just wanted to mention that in case anyone was wondering how it interacts. And this brings up another topic that's also related. Um, so I explained how we poll the completion path, but what we're doing there is we're not actually polling down to the Intel NVMe device. We're not polling the completion ring from QEMU. We're only polling Linux AIO's completion ring. So there's actually a little bit that we're not polling. And we're leaving it up to the Linux kernel to, to get those completions and put them into that software ring, that software queue that we poll. So there's two levels at which you can do polling. And it, it kind of makes sense that maybe if you poll at the lowest level directly at the hardware, you're, you're gonna get the best performance. Um, so that's an obvious question. And QEMU cannot do it from user space while the kernel has a block driver that's using that device because the block driver has its own state and QEMU can't interfere with that. So we're kind of stuck, except that there is a QEMU VFIO NVMe driver. So what that driver is, and it was presented here yesterday, there was a, there was a talk um, by it from FAM, and he's the one who wrote the driver. What it does is it adds a NVMe driver into QEMU. So QEMU itself uses basically PCI pass-through to directly talk to this device. And the great thing is FAM also added the polling interface that we have in QEMU. He added that for his NVMe driver so we can poll that too. And what's interesting is that the type of performance benefit you get from doing the polling is basically the same as what you get if you're not using uh, um, this driver, if you're just using files in Linux AIO. So we consistently see um, this speed up. Okay. So I just want to mention the status of this. Um, it was merged. Q uh, AIO context polling was already merged. It's already in QEMU 2.9. Um, it's automatically enabled when you use VertIO block data plane. So when you use VertIO block with IO threads. It's not automatically enabled in the main loop. So if you're not using IO thread, you can't get it. And the reason why is I mentioned earlier in, in this talk that um, there's lots of different types of file descriptors that we have in the event loop. And if we have some types of file descriptors that we cannot poll, then we disable polling because we don't want to sit there polling for, for whatever it is, say 30 microseconds, and, and add latency to those poor file descriptors that don't know how to poll. So if someone doesn't know how to poll, we don't poll at all. And therefore, if you want to use this feature, please use IO thread. Um, and just put your VertIO block device or your VertIO SCSI device in there, and then you'll get polling. And then you'll, um, you'll be able to take advantage of this. OK, um, are there any questions? Try any other measurements with higher Q defs to see if you bump into any other bottlenecks? Okay, so I, I couldn't hear you very well. I think the question was, did you try higher Q depths? Yeah, that's it. Okay, no, I, f I focused 
uh, well, at least on the benchmarks that I gathered here for this presentation, I focused just on the latency sensitive QDEP1 benchmark. <clears throat> so I have some more slides that I, that I can show. Uh, Merrick, just tell me when we're out of time and then I'll stop. <laughs> so so I, I, ha I have a few more things uh, probably worth mentioning. So um, I, I mentioned that this is already available in QMUNI. You can use it today. Um, and we, we had to choose a default value where polling makes sense. So today, the default value that QMUNI will use is 32 microseconds. And we found that it, it works very well with the NVMe drives. Um, and that it also means that in practice, you won't get much benefit from polling if you have a spinning disk, because it's just too slow. Not, you know, it's, it's probably won't complete within those 32 microseconds. OK, and um, instead of just showing you those bar charts, you can also take a look uh, and see the latency percentiles again. After applying this optimization, we, we can take a look at how many requests finished. And it's kind of interesting to compare this. Um, you can see on the host, we st so we still have that data set where on the host, we got 90% of all requests finished within 10 microseconds. And you can see the difference between with polling and without polling. So, what happens is that, and this, this makes a lot of sense, is that when polling is enabled, that yellow line is, is significantly and consistently lower than the orange line. And that's because now we're polling and we're not taking that notification. So our latency is going to be lower. See, we drop down to 20 microseconds. And this, these results are from inside the guest. So this is what FIO benchmark running inside the guest reports. Um, and what you can also see is that for those requests that take a long time, polling's not effective, and then the yellow line basically becomes the same as the orange line. Why? Because we're not polling anymore, because we have an adaptive algorithm that gives up after some point, so they become the same. And why is there that final asymptotic uh, <laughs> to infinity and beyond thing there? I'm, I'm not sure, so um, I still need to figure that out. But I thought that this was a nice graph to, to show that polling's really effective over all the percentiles where you would expect it to work. Okay, and then here's just a final thing to, if anyone is interested uh, about the exact benchmark configuration, you're welcome to download the, the slide deck and, and check it out. I've, I've kind of put all the details there for you. Thank you very much. <laughs>